Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the mailbox for the 6th of September 2012. My name is Total Biscuit, bringing you your daily dose of community interaction, gaming discussion, and all that good stuff. You can email in mailbox at cynicalbrit.com. That's mailbox at cynicalbrit.com with topics for future shows. The game in the background, as it will be for the next few episodes, is Planet Side 2. I'm going to start off with a little bit of disorganized zerging and then go into some actual outfit play later on in the series. First email comes in from Onin that says, Steam Greenlight launched recently and it's been quite a flop. Even the most popular games can't even surpass 25% of the required votes. Many potentially good titles are misinterpreted by idiots and downvoted for ignorant reasons. It's a Minecraft clone, and other potentially good titles are just buried under the sheer amount of games that applied for green light. To combat that latter issue, Steam decided to ruin everything, quote-unquote, by charging a $100 fee for listing on green light. At least the proceeds go to Child's Place, so no one could criticize this move as being another money grab, but there's been plenty of outcry over it. Personally, though, I don't see the issue with the fee. For one, it's really necessary, because I've seen a ton of listed games on the green light which weren't legit at all. Transport Tycoon Deluxe was listed by a random Steam user who doesn't own the IP, for example. For two, it's just $100 and it goes to charity. Steam is a retail platform. If your game is going up for retail, $100 is a very minor fee, nothing compared to Xbox Live Arcade fees. What are your thoughts on the fee and Greenlight's practices in general? Well, Greenlight is a goddamn mess, and quite frankly, I kind of saw this coming and covered this in a previous mailbox. I covered the wide variety of problems that this would have, and it turns out pretty much every one of them has turned out to be true. So that's not exactly a big surprise. I think the only thing that kind of has surprised me is that there's less bandwagoning and more anti-bandwagoning. It's a case of anything that's even interpreted as being remotely similar to a certain game is immediately slammed and called a clone, which is interesting because I thought we'd get a lot more people supporting games that are similar to other stuff like, say, Happy Wheels and Slender, although admittedly there are still plenty of Slender products on there that people are backing. From what I can see, there's currently 764 titles available there, so yeah, good luck getting that number of games properly rated. The first problem I've got with it is not the sheer amount of things that are on there. That's not really a massive deal, although it, it doesn't help. The main problem is quite simply this. There's a downvote button. Why? Why is there a I don't like this button? I'll tell you this, I don't care if you don't like it. It's not my problem. All that really matters is that the game has enough people that like it and want it. I don't like sports games, but I'm not going to run around downvoting every goddamn sports game and saying I don't want it on Steam. That's none of my business. That's not something that should be put in the hands of gamers. That's an incredibly stupid thing to do. Indeed, as far as I'm concerned, downvotes in general on an awful lot of sites, including YouTube, are absolutely pointless. They serve no practical purpose whatsoever. They used more often than not as a passive-aggressive parting shot for anonymous douchebaggery, and they serve absolutely zero purpose or use in terms of an actual usable metric. If 100,000 people vote up on a game and then 200,000 people vote down, do you launch the game on Steam or not? Why did 200,000 people vote down? Is it because the system just encourages them to have an opinion one way or the other? Because as far as I'm concerned, the only opinions that matter are, yes, I want it on Steam and I don't care. If you don't like the game, then that is not a good reason for it not to be on Steam. There are plenty of games on Steam that you no doubt do not like. It opens up a gigantic possibility for huge amounts of trolling and nonsense like that. And as I said, it's a completely useless metric. Aside from that, I think what we have very obviously discovered is that there are too many games on the green light list. The problem I've got with the green light is that it needs to be diluted down into some form that can actually be properly looked at by gamers. As far as I'm concerned, every game that's on green light should have a demo. Why? Well, it should be fairly obvious. It's really hard to say whether or not you want a title based on a couple of screenshots and a description. This is not Kickstarter. We need to be able to play it. We need to be able to actually try it and see what happens. Right now, demos are optional. The whole $100 thing does help to reduce the number of games that come in. Legitimate games should be able to afford that without too much of a problem. Illegitimate stuff, probably not. So that eliminates the majority of the issues with people submitting games that are not actually owned or created by them. But it does not solve the problem of there being 763 games on that list, the vast majority of which you have no real idea about, aside from the blurb that's been put on there and a couple of screenshots by the developer. 
We've now also got a massive number of campaigns trying to push people to vote for certain things. Needless to say, the whole Yog Ventures thing proved to be exactly right. Hey, Yog Ventures is on there. All right, so a bunch of people actually bum rush the damn thing in order to try and get it on Steam. So it puts a lot of power in the hands of some very interesting groups and the fact that this system is now so obtuse and so cluttered means that the majority of people I think are going to be simply turned off by it and aren't going to bother to participate. As a result what you do is you empower these select groups because of course when the general populace doesn't vote the interest groups and the fringe elements actually get more powerful because they will actually vote and their vote counts for a little bit more. Overall, while it was a promising system in its current state, it is a goddamn mess, and I'm hoping that they can do something about that. They are at least taking steps and realizing that the system as it currently stands is a complete and total joke, but I have to wonder why they didn't understand that before they put it out. I mean, really? You think that downvoting is a good idea? You think that not having demos is a good idea? You think that free submission by everybody wasn't going to be abused in some way? Come on, Valve, you know better than that. This email comes in from Will that says, Most gamers who play competitive multiplayer like League of Legends, StarCraft, and even MMO PvP, etc., have experienced both positive and negative attitudes from the opposing players. The negative side could include anything from immature name-calling to outright griefing, such as rage quitting or refusing to play. The positive side of things is when the team plays together and helps each other out with the occasional bit of friendly banter. My experiences with online competitive multiplayer have been somewhat negative with a few positive moments. However, when I play a game in person like Warhammer 40k or War Machine, most of the player base is positive with a few negative moments. I was wondering what your opinion is as to why this disparity occurs between online and in-person competitive multiplayer. Is it just my personal experience or is it just because with online multiplayer one has a computer to protect them from any physical confrontation that could occur with an in-person multiplayer game? I don't think it's really down to threats of violence. I mean, honestly, you don't actually see that many people resort to violence over a tabletop game. It has been known to happen every now and again, but really, that's not all that likely. I think it just is a case of you've got a computer between you and the other guy, and it's much, much easier to insult another guy without it being to that guy's face. Yes, of course, the idea that you might get into a fight is a possibility, but most of these people don't actually have the balls to insult someone to their face. That takes some actual courage. It should be fairly obvious if you attend any large gaming event, for instance. You have a lot of negativity online, and yet it's almost universally positive in person because the kind of people that go out there, either they keep their negativity online and they just don't dare to inflict it on people in real life, or they just aren't like that in general, and those kind of people will happily attend events and have a good time because they happen to be social. A lot of very socially awkward people insult people online pretty much all the time. They get involved in big flame wars, they troll hard, and they're generally unpleasant to everyone with no good reason. I think everyone gets unpleasant online every now and again. It's pretty much natural to do so. It's very natural to turn around and say, my god, why are you so damn stupid? Flame a teammate for doing really badly in a game like League of Legends or whatever. But I think the constant hatred and the constant trolling and flaming, that's kind of the mark of someone that's pretty damn socially awkward, and that person would not be able to handle it in real life. I think it's okay to blow off steam every now and again online though. I don't think that's necessarily an unhealthy thing to do. At the end of the day, in my experience over the past 28 years of living, most people are reasonably nice, but I've never met a person that I think is universally nice all the time. I don't think that's actually possible. I feel that those negative emotions get bottled up and they get unleashed at very inappropriate moments if you're not careful. So, you know, blowing off steam online is okay, and you might even find that the same people that are dicks online end up being the nicest people in the world in real life. Just because they happen to get it all out of their system with the competitive side of things, the flaming and the griefing and such. And at least online, it is not as harmful as it would be in real life. I wouldn't call it harmless by any stretch of the imagination. And I think anyone that believes that so-called cyberbullying is a myth is living in a fantasy world. Yes, indeed, words and constant abuse can actually get you down. There's no real question about that. They still mean the same, even if you can turn around and say, oh, well, it's just a line, you know, it's not real. The person behind it doesn't mean it. Well, there's no way to know that. I think, honestly, as well, games like StarCraft 2, which are very stressful, and League of Legends as well, tend to amplify that kind of behavior. StarCraft 2, if you lose, you have a tendency to BM. If you're losing, you're, it's very easy to attribute 
the reason why you lost to either some kind of cheese strategy used by the opposing player, so you don't view it as sportsmanlike. Maybe you view it as racial imbalance. It's very easy to blame the other guy and not yourself. And honestly, in StarCraft 2, there's only two people you can blame. Either it's you or it's the opponent. Most of the time, it's you, but it's very difficult to shout at yourself. So you're going to BM the other guy. In League of Legends you can be in a situation where someone on your team can drag you down very, very easily, and you can lose through absolutely no fault of your own. It could be this other guy that you've never met, you'll probably never run into again, so of course you slag him off. There are certain games that I feel don't induce quite as much anger and negativity. StarCraft 2 and League of Legends are most assuredly not two of them, however. All right, now I've got about 5,000 emails on this particular subject, so I might as well address it. I, I really don't know why it is that people ask me this stuff, because I think they know what the answer is. It makes me think that they just want some kind of affirmation or rant, but... When it comes to the Daily Mail, you don't really need to goad me all that much, so... A rather tragic story on the subject of a 14-year-old teenager who hanged himself. And needless to say, the Daily Mail decided to spin it in such a way as to implicate video games, because, of course, why not? So, those of you who don't know, the Daily Mail is a tabloid in the UK. The Daily Mail is known by some people as the Daily Heil, and the reason is they really kind of liked Hitler prior to Hitler trying to attack us, at any rate. They were a pretty big supporter of Hitler's policies and all stuff like that. So, yeah, not really so good. They are pretty much the paragon of yellow journalism in the UK. They have extremist views, more often veering towards the far right. They appeal to a primarily middle-class, middle-aged demographic who are stupid enough to actually accept that everything supposedly causes cancer, so says this particular paper. But don't worry, they'll bring you a new cancer treatment every sodding week. Watching television cures cancer, drinking tomato juice cures cancer, blah 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 blah, yes, and all sorts of other nonsense. They like scare stories, that's what they do. They very much hate video games, they despise them in all their forms, and whenever they get the opportunity to do so, they will try and make it out like a video game game is responsible for the latest horrible damn tragedy, which is wonderful. So, in this case, the guy played Call of Duty. Oh no. Yes, truly a horrible, horrible thing, is it not? He also frequently played the game with his stepdad, supposedly. He hung himself. Is there any evidence whatsoever that that had anything to do with the video game? Absolutely not. But did they write it in such a way? Oh yes, of course they did. They wrote it in such a way as to implicate video games without directly attacking video games because they know how much trouble they get into every time they actually do that. For instance, in the middle of the article, they were talking about whether or not the kid had been bu bullied at school. The quote goes as such, the head of year said that the school had looked into issues of bullying, but they could find no evidence of bullying, blah, blah, blah. And then they go on to say, for no apparent reason, slipping this in the middle of the sandwich, as it were, MPs have called for new restrictions on violent video games with Labour backbencher Keith Vaz, chair of the Home Affairs Select Committee, I might add this guy has been on an anti-video game rampage probably for the last decade and is essentially the political equivalent of Jack Thompson, leading calls for new powers to ban material rather than only apply age classification because Lord knows we need the government deciding what kind of material that we as adults can actually take part in. More to the point, it also comes down to the fact that the kid's mother was fairly strict with the choice of video games that this kid actually played, and yes, allowed him to play Call of Duty, which yes, is an 18-rated game, but I'm sorry. <laughs> Having watched a bunch of 12A stuff, including stuff like Total Recall, The Hunger Games, these are way more vicious and violent and far more graphic than Call of Duty ever will be. Call of Duty might as well be paintball. I mean, for God's sake, you shoot some people and money comes out of them. Come off it. There is nothing remotely objectionable about that. It's dumb, but it certainly isn't damaging to a teenager's psyche. I mean, come off it. There is no question that it is downright disgusting to misrepresent the facts, imply things which clearly are not true, attempt to sully the latest and greatest piece of media that is, of course, taking attention away from your horrific and outdated tabloid, and more to the point, drag this kid and his family's name through the mud in your own personal crusade in order to pander to older and, quite frankly, delusional and uninformed people. It is, as far as I'm concerned, astonishing and pathetic that we should even have to address such things in 2012 where the majority of the population plays video games, where video games have become an extremely successful multi-billion dollar international high-tech industry. An industry which time and again has had to face accusations from pseudoscientists, quacks, 
and sensationalist fear peddlers who are only interested in selling an extra copy to your grandmother. Time and again, no evidence is actually presented. Time and again, studies are done and find no link whatsoever between violence in real life and violence in video games. And then, needless to say, in the same tabloid, we have wonderful glowing praise of extremely violent television shows, movies, and books. Because, needless to say, those are accepted forms of media, so clearly they cannot be any threat at all. Ladies and gentlemen, I am quite frankly sick of it, and it annoys me greatly that I have to even address it, but as John Walker in a recent article on Rock Paper Shotgun on this particular issue entitled How the Daily Mail Uses Tragedy to Spread Gaming Fear points out, silence these days seems to be taken as the implication of guilt, and there is no way that we can stand idly by and continue to have this nonsense peddled about our industry, our chosen hobby, and indeed about us as people. These stereotypes and this misinformation must be continuously debunked bunked everywhere it is found until it ceases to have any clout whatsoever. And the only way to defeat ignorance is to fight it with logic, common sense, and rational discourse. My thoughts go out to the family at this difficult time. Okay, folks, that's me done for the day. Thank you very much for watching The Mailbox, and I'll see you next time.